Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Central Texas, 1870, near the town of Dripping Springs. As the blistering sun beats down upon them, a small group of Texas rangers make their way through the limestone-strewn meadows and patches of oak and cedar. Though the heat is repressive, neither the rangers nor their mounts seem unduly affected. As they ride, the rangers' eyes are veritably glued to the ground, searching for any sign of their quarry having passed through these parts. They have been alerted that a band of Comanches, the universally feared lords of the southern plains, have been raiding local ranches, stampeding and killing livestock, and making off with a number of their horses. Though their veritable empire had been long in the state of retraction, the mighty Comanche are still an incessant and very dangerous threat here on the Texas frontier roughly 25 miles west of the capital of Austin. In command is Captain Rufus Perry, a longtime ranger and veteran of countless engagements with the Comanche. Born in Alabama in 1822, Perry had migrated west to Bastrop, Texas, with his family in 1833. He had participated in the siege at Behar and fought alongside ranger legends such as Samuel Walker, Bigfoot Wallace, Henry and Ben McCulloch, and Jack Hayes. At 48 years old, he is the eldest and most experienced in the group by a substantial margin. Most in this contingent of little more than two dozen are scarcely over the age of 22. Amongst the youngest of these men is one Frank Payne, a native of Austin, Texas, who is scarcely in his late teens. However, despite his age, Payne too is a veteran of at least one encounter with the dreaded and deadly Comanche. In 1866, at roughly the age of 12 or 13 years old, the young man had accompanied his father and several other local men on what was known as a cow hunt, or an effort to scour the countryside west and northwest of Austin in order to round up any strays that may have wandered into the natural labyrinth created by the many creek beds and canyons. Even in 1866, this was still considered a reasonably dangerous task as roving bands of Comanche only a few miles outside of town was still not an altogether uncommon occurrence. However, it had still been deemed a safe enough adventure to the young Frank Payne's father to allow his young son to participate, albeit only to observe from a distance. After making their way northwest of the city of Austin, the small party found themselves atop one of the many limestone cliffs that overhang the meadows and creek sides of the Texas hill country. While making their way along the ridgeline of a small canyon, they spotted a small group of Comanche engaged in what seemed to be a long-awaited feast. The following is an excerpt from A.J. Soule's Early Settlers and Indian Fighters in Southwest Texas. The white men at once made preparations to attack them and drew back under cover and held a council. They did not wish to let the Indians escape without a fight, but Mr. Payne was concerned about his young son Frank for fear that he would get hurt. The boy was about 12 years of age and was not carrying any arms. The elder Payne finally told his son to remain where he was and not to leave the spot until the fight was over, and some of them came back for him. Loath to waste the rare occasion of catching a group of Comanche off guard, the attack was made at once, with the skilled ranchers making their way down the steep embankments in short order to engage the unwitting Comanche. Soul's account of the event continues. These accounts now being agreed upon, the white men advanced and charged upon the Indians, who at once mounted their horses and fled. The whole party of whites and Indians were soon lost to sight of Frank across a low range of hills. The cowmen, being on good horses, soon came within pistol range and the fight commenced, the Indians giving shot for shot and war whooping as they went. Young Payne, from his position in the rear, heard all this commotion and became very anxious to witness the combat. Accordingly, he put spurs to his pony and galloped to the top of the ridge where he could have a plain view, not intending to go any further. When he arrived at the crest of the elevation, however, he met a loose and terror-stricken horse coming out of the fight, and the boy's horse took fright at him and ran away, and instead of going back the way he came, ran straight ahead and followed into the wake of the Indian. The white men were scattered and one of them unhorsed, and the boy soon passed all of them and ran into the natives. Mr. Payne saw the peril his son was in, and when he passed, called out, Hold up, Frank, hold up! That was what the boy was trying to do with all of his strength, but the pony had the bit in his mouth and was beyond control. The Indians evidently thought this a daring and intentional charge on the part of the young white brave and, yelling loudly, prepared to fight him. The boy passed some of the Indians who shot at him and threw lances from all sides. Finally, a bullet, arrow, or lance cut his bridle rein in two. 
His horse then increased his speed and soon got clearer of all the Indians. Frank now took the rope from the horn of his saddle and, making a lope, leaned forward and secured it over the nose of his horse, finally stopping him. In the meantime, the elder Payne had followed his son as fast as he could in order to try and save him, and fought his way through the Comanche, scattering the balance. Young Frank made a circle and came back. Besides having his bridle rein severed, two arrows were sticking into his saddle. Only one of the cow hunters was wounded. He was able to ride, and when his horse was brought back he mounted, and the party arrived at home without further incident. Rather than be dissuaded from a life of hardship and violence with the Texas Rangers, the young man found his brush with death only briefly whetted his appetite for frontier adventure. Payne had signed on with the Rangers earlier in this year of 1870, and had been assigned to headquarters at a place known as Camp San Saba Springs, near present-day Coleman, Texas. After being alerted to the Comanche activity, the company has made their way south, now nearing a large hill located roughly six miles south of present-day Marble Falls, Texas, known as Shovel Mountain. As the contingent of rangers, clothed in outfits suited to hill country practicality and armed to the hilt with Colt revolvers and repeating rifles, make their way around the base of the mountain, their ears are perked by the faint sound of a man's voice crying out in English. His words are indiscernible, but his plight is obvious, as his tone is that of a desperate and nearly hopeless man. Suddenly, just as Captain Rufus Perry is cautiously advancing his men around a bend in the trail, the alabaster silhouette of a nude white man catches even the most weary among them off guard. His eyes are wide, his mouth caked with dried saliva, and his once scarcely discernible cries now ring clear as a bell to the rangers, veterans and neophytes alike. Comanche, Comanche, the man cries, as the war whoops of his pursuers can now be heard in a simultaneous instant. The mere word Comanche now speaks gravity of the situation at hand. The man runs headlong towards them, desperately flinging himself towards the thick of the ranger formation as if he were a tired runner upon the final stretch of a race, finishing only with his last vestiges of effort and energy. Now, just as the unknown, unfortunate, and unclothed settler tumbles into the relative cover of their company, the rangers are met with the daunting sight of several pursuing Comanche, incensed and incredulous at both the decades of encroachment and the spoiling of their raid. However, the pursuing warriors now having spotted their pursuers, instantaneously draw their ponies to a halt and reverse course, seeking to drive their newly gotten horse herd west in an effort to escape, now that the proverbial hand of fate has turned them from hunter to hunted. The account from AJ's soul continues. The Indians had 100 head of horses and were going slow on account of the rough country. The rangers now made a flank movement to the right, keeping under cover of the brush until near the horses, and then making a sudden dash to cut them off from the Indians in a narrow place. They ran them back south against the foot of Shovel Mountain and left three men to hold them there until the battle was over. The rangers knew they would have to fight the Indians as they were in a large force and yelling loudly. It seems that during the excitement of running the settler, the Indians and horses had become scattered, and the rangers taking cover and coming out in an unexpected place by a bold, quick dash had secured the horses. The Indians collected in plain view of the rangers and began to divest themselves of blankets and outriggings and to pile them up on the ground. The rangers now advanced and dismounted in a post oak ravine, tied their horses, and filled the magazines of their Winchesters full of cartridges and awaited the charge they saw the Comanches were about to make. The Indians numbered 125, as near as could be ascertained, and the rangers, 28, besides the three who were holding the herd of horses just behind the mountain. The Indians, when they did charge, made a turn and were caught in such a rapid fire that the savage warriors retreated back to their position. The three plucky Indians could not get to the horses without passing within gunshot of the position close to the rangers, and a short but desperate fight took place. The Comanches, however, soon gave back before the galling fire of the Winchesters. They fought with muzzle-loading guns, bows, and lances. Captain Perry was a good Indian fighter and handled his men well. The Indians killed in this charge were carried off by daring fellows on horseback, who would lean from the saddle and, taking them by their long hair, drag them back to cover. In the third charge, the Indian chief was killed and his horse ran in among the rangers with the dead body, which was held to the saddle by a strong strap of leather. If the horse had gone back the other way, the body of the chief would not have been captured. The Indians evidently overrated the force of rangers on account of the number of shots fired. The Comanche finally left after suffering a heavy loss. The dress and rigging of the head chief 
were taken to Austin and placed in the Capitol building. One ranger is killed during the brief but vicious engagement. A young man in his early 20s, identified as one of the three Cox brothers serving with the detachment at the time. His body is taken to the Bird Town Cemetery, where he is interred into the hard scrabble ground roughly 11 miles north of today's Johnson City. Frank Payne would continue his service with the Rangers throughout the 1870s, eventually marrying and fathering five children. The family would settle in Leakey, Texas, where Frank would pass away in 1900. Rufus Perry would continue his already legendary career with the Texas Rangers, participating in the Battle of Deer Creek in 1873, before eventually retiring from the Rangers in 1874. The tales of just Frank Payne and Rufus Perry alone are enough to fill countless episodes with their tales of bravery and brutality on the very bleeding edge of the Texas frontier. So too are the tales of both gallantry and gall from the mighty and merciless Comanche, perhaps the greatest empire builders on the North American continent until the late 19th century when their way of life was sadly and abruptly brought to an end. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.